takes 3,000 to A7, an average bird, dead mall. BDI got down. BBI here. I want to stop and say thanks. Thanks for tuning in and checking out whatever the video is about that's about ready to come up next. If you could take a minute and hit subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you enjoy what you've seen here, make sure to hit the like button. We'd greatly appreciate your support. Anyhow, guys, all that aside, let's get on with the show. morning boys and girls um, I got myself a beautiful like 14 hours of sleep I desperately needed it I was running on zero it's come to my con attention that yesterday I spelled black wrong in the video editing portion of the process I'm, I'm over it it's okay so if you guys can remember back a couple segments ago where I was laying out the deck for this and I had us lay the lid and the floor pan together and then measure out and then do a transfer there's a reason for that let me explain to you or show you where the, how that trick comes into play now. So now we're going to be looking up in this area. Because we had the two plates together, the two lids, the base and the ceiling, that hole, which is right here, is now directly over the center of the hole for the base of the tube. So at the bottom of the tube we drilled a three inch hole. For the lid, we got to drill ourselves a four and a half inch hole to marry up perfectly with our chimney. And that's about the only way you can keep those two straight. You can do a bunch of measuring with that little ghetto hood rack tactic that I learned there from the great men that preceded me in this. Um, will save you a bunch of headache. Always pre-drill. It's a cheap, quick, easy solution. So now my goal here today is to get these finally assembled. There we go, just like that. And you'll see once again the center of the they match up. So let's go play outside. That's where I'm off to next. That's where you're gonna go and you're all gonna go with me. Okay. <clears throat> So I always bolt the plate down to something solid and very flat. Don't try to freehand this. You want to have both hands free to be able to run the drill. So we're going to use this as our guide hole, and we're going to go really stupid slow. Okay, now we're through. Go to low range. done just like that so now we're through now we've got a perfectly drilled four and a half inch hole in the top of the deck plate
thing. Okay, so we're going to use half inch aluminum, um, half inch little grill. I don't want to have any more restriction on the top side of this, and we're going to let this grill actually dictate to us where we're going to drill our holes to mount our chimney with. Um, I found it's easier to lay this out first and then to uh, pilot drill the, the holes into the chimney material second. I found that round holes have a tendency to whistle if you get them in too small. It's like the OD of the hole is too small. Remember, this is more or less to keep people from putting their fingers down this hole. This is safety precaution, more than it is talking about trapping the RF inside the RF inside the deck. So put one there. Punches have already to take a crap. I don't have time to run over and get another one today. I'm running out of time, man. So it's four. Six. Seven. Eight. And we gotta mark all of this because I'm gonna move it into the other room here in a minute. I'm gonna go get a Sharpie. I took it apart and fixed it. She's running a little dry. Guys, remember it's super and paramount that we take pride in everything that we build all the time because it's going to be around for decades and decades. It's not common, I mean it's not uncommon for me to work on something that is 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. Take pride in what you do, your name's attached to it.
what I'll do is after I pull these off, I'm gonna take and I'll put the drum sander on the on the drill press, and I'll sit there and I'll, and I'll deburr this entire lip and make it nice and super smooth, so somebody can go and run their hand across it. So somebody can go and run their hand across it, and they're not gonna feel any rough edges. Now, this isn't something that you're gonna see directly from the outside. Most ant builders that you uh, run across today, they would consider this the outside of the deck. To me, this is the inner shield. The outer portion of the deck is a cosmetic piece that goes over the outside of this. Is it absolutely necessary? No. Is it way better and cooler to do it this way? Yes. So now I'll go and I'll sand all of this. Because remember, these are our outside lids. The outside to the RF deck. Not the amplifier, the RF deck. So we want to kind of keep this dirt and scratch free. Um, so I keep hitting it with the blower because I don't want any of these other little pieces of aluminum. Just scratch this. Even though, once again, it's going to be on the inside and, and no one's going to be able to see it unless they open it up. I don't want my customer to have a big nasty scratch right across the top of his, the lid to his RF deck. Same. All right, let's go inside again. The goal is to make the hole bigger than your exhaust orifice. Okay, I see guys chins up on this all the time. That little hole saw is $47, $48 or whatever, and it's just slightly bigger then, I mean, it's literally an eighth of an inch bigger. Okay, because it's, what, four and a half is a, the anode top. The inside of here is like four and a half or whatever, or four and a quarter. And the hole that we punched was a four and a, four and a half. This is not some place that we want to skimp, because any kind of air restriction that we have here backs up through the rest of the box. So, if you're going to have a choke point in the whole amp, like I was trying to explain last night as I was bumbling over my words so tired. If you're gonna have a choke point in a box, why not make it the thing that's designed to be the choke point, which is the tube? Instead of having the floor and the bottom pressurized thing to me is dead. It's over. It's not even a conversation anymore. Which is superior. Okay. And there's gonna be some old school guys that are gonna disagree with me. That's fine. I'm comfortable. I got big boy britches on. Believe me when I tell you, I can fucking take the pressure. All right, let's mock this up. Now, because we are wanting to Because we're wanting to have an oversized orifice opening here, we are going to show half the piece of Teflon. Remember, this is only a half inch thick. So our attachment hardware has to go in at an angle. It can't go straight down. It's got to go in at an angle. That's important. Pull everything to the lid. So we want to take just a hot minute before we go and start slapping stuff in here. This is one of the things that we must go slow on. friend come over here a couple weeks ago his name was Fred and he was watching me walk, work on that RF deck and he goes man how do you because every single time you just you like freehand it and you nail it every single time he goes how do you do that and it's a practice 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 so this is lid number one and we'll make this chimney number one 
You gotta be really careful with Teflon because nothing sticks to Teflon. No Sharpie or nothing. So if I rub around on this too much, I'll rub the Sharpie will come right off. So now, being that this is our perfect height, we're gonna utilize this piece and we're gonna got to mark it also back side. When I go to re-index it, I'm going to put this, I'm going to scratch my lid. Let's get rid of that round, I don't need it. When I go to re-index this, I don't want to be, how's this go? And spin this round 55 times. So I should take the lid completely out of the workspace. Okay. Drilling in at an angle for a reason. Start straight. dinner <clears throat> a couple nights ago with some friends and they were asking me they're like how how do you see all this in your head and that's the hardest part of this whole game is getting people up to speed with their visualization skills you got to be able to picture the whole thing in your head it's oh get guys all the time, man, will you teach me how to do this? Can you teach me? Yeah, but for me to teach you how to do this, you gotta actually technically start over here and do this other thing first. And they don't understand that there's a, there's a train of thought that goes along with that, that you have to, can't just jump right in like, oh man, I wanna build my own 32 pill. Okay, do you just wanna build it or do you wanna actually be able to repair it and work on it if you have a problem or you just want a 32 pill and you don't want to pay somebody else to do it. The guy that actually wants to learn how to work on it and do it isn't really too overly interested in his motivation isn't from uh, the place of trying to save a dollar because he doesn't want somebody else you know don't want to pay somebody else to do it he wants to actually be able if it breaks he wants to be able to fix it himself kind of thing I'll help those kind of people but you all got to start at the same place the same place I did let's go build a two pill okay This is lid number one, chimney number one, right? Yeah, lid number one, chimney number one. <laughs> I 
oriented wrong. Look at that now. Now look at that. All the holes are dying up. Oh. Alright. Let's try this again. <laughs> I'm like, what did I... I must have done something wrong. What did I do? Alright. Now my favorite form of attachment here, believe it or not, these are pill screws. And the reason I'm using them is one, they're tiny, but two, they've got themselves a cut to the base of them, so they're self-tapping. Very, very, very fine cut at the tip. Wow, really two thirds of the camera is covered up. Really focus. There you go. They're self tapping. The tough one's really soft. So, I guess you could use sheet metal screws. I guess. It's not my preferred thing. Even though this is a form of sheet metal screw, what I mean is like big, big thread, hard point self-tapping I don't know I prefer a little bit more elegant form of attachment I guess Now it's just like torquing down a tire on a car. Now there's many ways to do this. This is just my preferred way to do it. You could do clips that attach to the Teflon and you know all kinds of things. I This is just my preferred form of attachment. My way of doing it. There's lots and lots and lots of other ways. Fixed on there. one and then the next step and then the next step the question is going to come up why don't you just put a fan guard on there and be done with it i could do that i've done that i did that on a couple um you know as you progress and you grow in anything in life your style changes you know, when I was a younger man, I used to think car audio was the coolest thing in the world. And um, then you go out and you build yourself the million dollar setup and as you get older and your style changes the way, you, uh, like I look at my, 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 uh, my shootout truck for car audio. 
I look at that today and go, oh man, I'd do this so much different shit today. You know, and so your style changes a little bit. Me personally, this is, uh, looks a little cleaner and here we are about two years later and just like the look, like the style. But uh, whatever you do, you'll never catch me uh, putting it inside of a Tupperware container. It still blows my mind. A guy thinks that plastic is some kind of RF shield. Not at the HF frequencies, it ain't. God dang. Just because the RF won't conduct down the outside of some plastics and fiberglass does not mean that it will not pass through it. Anywho, um... I don't know, style, style. I'm excited, I'm really excited. I get this last screw in, and I get to go and do the very last final steps of putting together the RF deck, which I'm not gonna lie, I'm really excited about that. I am very, very excited about that. I think there's a little trick that I've had planned into the build of this thing now for about three, four weeks that I finally get to see come to fruition. And y'all are gonna be like, whoa, that, wow, that's a cool trick. Kill two birds with one blower. Done. Square, square, not kicked at an angle. You poke your finger at it, it's not going to bend it. No restriction and safe. All right. All right. Come on, can't come on, clubs. Filming out of a jail. Alright, so we've got a. We don't want to come in here and touch a bunch of shit. You got to think about the amount of pressure that's on that doorknob, right? There's a lot. You got your high voltage, plus you're going to have your RF on this thing here. So, most of the insulating capabilities of that component are made up of its overall surface area and its distance that it's allowed to apply. So it's a very special cleaner. We want to supply ourselves the best opportunity for success. So we're going to clean the doorknob thoroughly just in case there's any little pieces of metal or mucus or you know man love up on here because unless I have some kind of catastrophic problem I'm not going to be back up in here again salt oil and grit and grime and crap that we don't want to have on our parts. Okay. So this is lid. Which amp is this? It's Exorcist. This is two. Okay.
See how it's barely kissing the top of the tube? I mean, it is barely kissing the top of that tube. Oh, that's perfect. And you can see light kind of gleaming through the gap there, but that's it's nothing for us to worry about. It's perfect. Let me uh, put a couple screws in the lid and I'll take the camera off the tripod. Give me a second. This turned out perfect. Look at this. It's just kissing the top of the tube, which is perfect. What this means is, is that we're exposing the most amount of tube surface to air as we can. I mean, there's probably quarter of an inch gap here and you got to remember how bright the lights are that we're I mean it's flooded with light right where we're at oh probably just a hair over a sixteenth of an inch touch here and as you guys can clearly see there's no gap up here it's the light penetrating into the Teflon wicking back this is perfect oh this come together better than I could possibly have dreamed so think about that, that's a lot of little tricky measurements from the floor to the top of the tube to the roof and then inversely you could take the same chimney and put it on the floor and do the through, you know, through the bottom air restricting way. Oh, that's perfect. I'm excited. Oh, I'm excited. Okay. Let's get the next one done. This whole box is completed. Now, all the parts in here are where they need to be. Blower's blowing, air's flowing out the chimney, the filament cooling system's in place. I'm going to show that to you here in a minute. There's one small problem. It's a big, giant, resonant drum. Hmm. Hmm, what did I do? This one sounds like a train whistle. This one sounds like running water. What did I do? Hmm. 
This is going to go inside of another box, by the way. It's all full of Dynamat, otherwise known as Hushmat. Aligned all the interior panels, including the floor and the bottom of the, the box of hush mat, and I put hush mat on the back of the fan, cutting the volume of the fan by at least two thirds. Now we're going to put this inside of another enclosure, and it's going to trap all the blade noise. Now on the back side of the enclosure that this box is going to go in, I'm going to have yet some more different style of hush mat that's going to trap the blade noise. That little tiny bit of high pitch that you hear is actually the more blade noise. So it's just going to be rushing air. Way quieter than what it just was. Like, way quieter. So we're down here on the floor. And we're pointed at the diode board. Because we got the amps mounted, but what I wanted to point out was this. That is our filament cooling system. Like I said before, it draws fresh air in, but it exhausts straight down, as you can see, straight down under our diode board. Very important. The diode boards don't take a lot of air to get cooled, but we don't want the air to sit static over the board and for them to cook. And since uh, we're already up to one, two, three, four, five, six fans, I was thinking, well, let's kill two birds with one stone. All right, let's get to wiring these decks up. I am ready. I don't know about you. Okay, so we're finally at the point where we're gonna start testing stuff. So let me start turning my 220 Variac here. And there's a thousand volts. 16. 3,000. There's four. Five, six. And the core is fully saturated with 240 volts going in. That's 6,500 volts on the cap. Soft start's been bypassed. Can't even hear the transformer working. Our bleeders are warming up. No explosions. I have 100% confidence in this circuit now. Let's test the other one. Let me tell you what commitment is. You see these little tiny set screws that are here? Anytime camera. This little tiny set screw. Well, the guy that I bought these meters that I'm installing here from says, oh no, I'll send you all the hardware and everything. Well, he sent me this many that don't have any set screws in them. So, sitting here dinking around, going, oh no, what the frig, man? They happen to have a 632 thread in them. So now I gotta go hand make set screws for each one of these. I'll be back. You, know, you got a simple desire, you just wanna build something, right? And then you go out and you spend, you don't, you guys even understand. I don't want to use Chinese meters. I friggin' hate Chinesium technology. I want to use the most American made components I can find. And so, homeboy says to me, man, I got a bunch of meters out of this transmitter I'm demolishing. I'm like, cool. Well, if I pay you like 300 bucks, can you send me a complete set of meters? all the same resistance in the meter movement because they come out of, you know, Harris and Collins and those kind of things. American made parts. I hate Chinesium meters. I hate them. They're cheap and they're shitty. And I asked him like three times, dude, make sure to send me all the mounting hardware, all the hardware. I need all the hardware. Oh, you got it, man. Well, the hardware shows up, but then it's missing the hardware that goes inside the hardware.
each one of these has had to been like handcrafted, fitted to the. Okay, that'll work. Knock that finger burr off of that thing. It's too late. I'm too late. I got a hard delivery date in like five days for these things. I can't. I can't like reorder. Hell, the plexiglass sheet, because it's half or a quarter inch thick. That's bullet resistant Lexan that I'm making this thing out of. You don't even want to know how much that sheet was and how long I had to wait to have that delivered here. Well, it's already got holes in it from the meters. So even if I got a Chinese meter that was somehow magically sitting over here, it's not going to mount up to the hardware. What, because I didn't get the little set screws? Sorry, I just, I had to rant for a minute. I'm sorry. Damn. Every step of the way, when I've had to rely on somebody else to do something other than me physically going out and getting something for this entire process, I have been let down. It's all good. Almost to the end of this, this project, and it has been interesting, to put it mildly. <sighs> okay. So here, here was the idea, is I wanted to get transmitter stop picks so my new guys that don't know any different, they'll know how to read their meters, okay? So on our plate amps, our zero signal is going to be somewhere right here, okay? But I can adjust that. Uh, that moves. Now a single three shouldn't pull anything more than about two and a half amps ever no matter what you do to it. Even though our plate supply can go all the way over here and actually off the scale at the tap that we're running it at. We're gonna tell them no more than two and a half amps, maybe three at the most. Our top voltage or resting voltage should be somewhere right at about 6,500 to almost 7,000 volts. And the bottom that you wanna pull it down to, somehow, I don't know how you'd be able to do it, <clears throat> Even if you're pulling two and a half amps, the power supply is only gonna fall down to about here. But we'll say somewhere between five and 7,000. We'll safety margin operation windows for them to know where to be. To make those little set screws cost me three hours of work. But it's worth it to me. It's worth it. All right. This is one of two I've gotta do. And tomorrow I gotta run out and buy new on-off switches because apparently uh, when I ordered switches and they showed up, I ordered six, I grabbed the bag, I never counted what was in the bag. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, and there's five. Shorter switch. Because once again, because I relied on some other source of person to do something, they can't simply count to six. Anywho, so now I'm gonna go find new switches that I like that actually fit my design parameters. Now this is crystal clear Virgin Lexan. I mean crystal clear. We got the backer, I'm trying to keep the backer on it so we don't scratch this. That's the goal, until I'm ready to be done with it. And then I've gotta build a window aluminum L bracket, well not all the way around, just this top leading edge. It's actually what I should work on next for this. I think that's what I'll do. Okay, off to the races. All the 12 volt circuits test out, all the 110 circuits test out, all the 220 circuits test out. Got our little window frame made. Made it so the door doesn't hit the freaking knobs. Um, now I've got to find switches. So I'm going to do tomorrow. And then it's all downhill. Wire up the meter shunts that I installed tonight. So they actually tie into the meters. 
tie up on off switches, punch a hole in it for the power wire, connect our in and output coaxes, connect our RCA jack for our remote foot pedal, um, tie in our fan on top, and I'm ready to key this sucker. That turned out quite nicely, if I don't say so myself. Remember that plastic is clear. It's going to look really cool. And then maybe, maybe I'll put an LED strip down the back to backlight it. Because remember, it's going to have sides on it all the way around on a lid, so you won't be able to see into it. But this plexiglass is important because all the high voltage is right here behind this panel. You got to protect the uh, protect the last the the owner of these things. So that looks good. I'm proud of that, and I can live with that. That's good. All right. Three auto zones later and seventy-five dollars, and we've got switches. Front interface is on. I just got to wire it all up. <laughs> it turned out better than I could have ever possibly imagined. Not the switches I wanted, but these will work. I got to mount a switch. I got to call my customer and find out which way he wants the door to open. Open left or open right. And then I got to mount down a switch in the corner that'll run off to a power supply. So when the switch goes click, it'll open. This light turns on and it shines down so they can see what the switches are in the dark. I can live with this. I can live with this. Okay, let's do the other one. Uh, let's see, got up, came out here, was started my day at 8.30. It's now like 10.30 at night or whatever. And this is what I've spent the last six hours straight doing tie and wire <sighs> throw a hitch in it just so close to being ready to run it all the metering circuits are now in it both of them, actually. These are the last couple little things I gotta do. And I gotta tie in the door light and hook up the key circuit, the foot pedal. And we're ready to test. It is 99, 98% completed. I did all of the All the fashion work today. There you go, slide, baby. Got all the meters run, mounted face plates down. All my control switches are on. I'm running out of vinegar for this. Just getting tired. There are two wires here. Make another loop. There's two wires here I want to tie up. starts to hurt right through here on your finger, through here, through here, <laughs> feeling it, really getting to feel it sitting here on the floor, I've been sitting here for six hours doing this, I'll throw another hoop in it, come on. Is it 
three in the other one. I gotta put three on this one. Just thing, if if it doesn't make one watt, which I know it will, um, this thing is still an insane piece of work of art. I mean it. thinking how I could have done all these zip ties in probably 20 minutes. New. I gotta rock it old school. Okay, so I got all my safety circuits in. Um, part of my metering circuit is in. All the on-off control switches are in. Looks surprisingly like this in the other box. Imagine that. All tied up and pretty. Just like this one. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn the cabinet and I'm going to tie up these last four wires. Maybe in Chinesium 10 kVA rated. Hmm. Yeah. So I just showed you the segment of the pass through capacitor that failed. That was amazing. Um, we turned the exorcist on and ran it for about a half an hour, and that pass through capacitor ended up exploding on us in an environment violent violent way but all the safety circuits worked and all we had to end up doing was replacing the fuse holder and putting a new 5 amp slow blow fuse in it and um, what we ended up doing was we took a piece of uh, high temperature quarter inch thick fiberglass and we put a put a stud through it and hooked up to that and then we went on with our went on with our day but when it came along to the demon we had a we had a demon in that box. We spent probably six hours chasing it. I don't know if you guys can think back to the couple first segments. You'll see that there's these two caps that are actually sitting in this orientation inside the box, and they were sitting just like this. And when you look at these things, they don't look like they have any damage to them. Well, what we were having a problem with is we turn the amp on and it would sit there and idle and with a high voltage applied it would be anywhere from 30 seconds to four minutes and as soon as we go to try and create any kind of RF power it go PAM and blow up it would blow the safety fuse out and the, the you know the contactors would kick out fans stay running all the lights stay on the filament stay on it was just killing out the high voltage so after a very slow process of elimination and going through it step by step we determined that wherever the flashover was taking place was in the high voltage deck. So we really started looking and what, what keyed me off initially is I'd look down in there and now there was a, there's a, a connector that goes between these two points and I could see this gray. You see this gray on the doorknob right here? I went, oh, I don't like the look of that. So we went and we took it apart. You see that discolorization? See this discolorization that's here? That's where the two caps are touching together. And the high voltage was arcing, running down the outside of the cap, and jumping over to the bottom side of this thing. You can clearly see the arc burn on the inside pin here. This took a little while to work around. Every time that safety circuit would go off, we'd have to go in and clean the fuse holder out and start over again long process of getting that one running but once we did it ran and ran very very well so just want to throw that in there because we're going to start jumping forward now we're going to start adding a whole bunch of videos to it i ended up running out of time to be able to shoot the video the way i wanted so 
I had to I had to make the choice either I do the video or I get the product delivered on time we ended up having a lot of other other failures from this high voltage jump into ground which is common in trying to flesh out a new project but once you get this taken care of it's like you know we pulled these doorknobs out and grabbed another 1000 puff cap and another 400 puff cap I think I put a 500 puff cap in there as soon as we got those little problems out of the way everything went as smooth as silk so we're going to jump forward now in the build process instead of painfully walking through it like we were we're going to go straight on to day before yesterday i literally wheeled them out of the shop because i wanted to see what they looked like in the daylight and for some reason i ended up spending the afternoon just doing all the final assembly like the external plates and the doors and that kind of stuff all the final fit and finish stuff on it outside and that's where we're going to go next as soon as we get done with that then we're going to go to the test section of the video so enjoy guys sorry one more little add-on to that is if i show it in one i've done it on both and so what i mean by that is when we had that high flute and high dollar pass-through capacitor uh, fail on us we just went ahead and took it out of the other box and replaced it with a pass-through stud the same thing with the doorknobs at the bottom of the plate choke. Um, once we had a failure on one box, we just re replaced the capacitors on both. And to help avert the problem, we went and we cleaned the capacitors really, really well. Um, they were put in there with gloves on, oil free, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of that is the way it has been in the video. And I'm saying this for a disclaimer reason that if I show it being done on one box, it was done on the other one immediately. We just didn't bother to video it, so. Okay, moving forward. still have the door shims to put in the corners to make it so they open and close smoothly. But we'll put those in after we're done transporting them. shims in. Full dynamat lined inside and out, dual layered on the top. One sexy mother. You, man, I feel like a dog that's just been fisted by a porn star or something. I'm freaking tired. I know, and you're not over. You're not done till what do you? Tuesday? Sunday. Tuesday? Monday? Tuesday. Tuesday. But this is the last big hurdle getting this done. It really is. I'm. Okay, guys. So what I ended up doing 
is I had to stop video and I started running out of time I'm up against the wall so what we skipped over was the meter circuit construction um, putting the meter shunt in and the knockdown shunt for the high voltage and that's it we got all the tins on as you guys seen in the couple previous segments so now we're moving to the section that everybody's been waiting for for three whole segments of video the actual test portion so let's start out here and I'm gonna run you around the lap it's a 5kw slug in 2x and PEP 10,000 watt slug and average 5 watt slug in reverse back from the monster oil cooled bird 10,000 watt dummy load over here to show us input tune and input drive, we've got our 1000 watt slug in peak, and over here we've got a 50 watt slug in reverse. Don't focus on my hand, focus on the meter, you fuck. I think I'm far enough in I can start swearing now without getting demonetized. So what we're using over here is my backup Cobra 29, going directly into the back of the LD MOS. This is a two pill LD MOS driver. That coax is coming out, running over and running through these two bird meters. Coax coming out, running around and going to the input. Here's our output coax, which is RG393. RG393. Coming around. Coming around, getting whacked on the snacks, called Snoopy Snacks. Okay, and we're coming around to the three meters in a row. All right. We got to use 393 for the distance and the amount of different couplers and stuff. We're going to get it a little bit warm today. But that is that. That's the sequence of events. So, let me turn on the two pill unit. With about a watt and a half, now this is a thousand watt slug in peak in five times so one two five so we're reading this middle scale adding a couple zeros and we're going to tickle this Ooh. put about 2500 peak watts in from the two pill ld moss unit they put that in perspective we'll shut the two pill off takes that much drive to make that much power kind of cool isn't it so let's go down here now I'm not going to test both boxes we're just going to show you the operation of one because they're exactly the same so first we're going to turn on our fans get our AC side running our DC side running we're going to bring on our filament Voltage. We're idling at about 7,000 ish volts. It's actually about 6,900 somewhere in here. So let's go ahead, we'll fire on down on our foot pedal. Zero signal is just a hair below 7,000 volts. And now we're going to run the shit out of this thing. So let me close the door. <clears throat> now I'm only going to do this once so everybody pay attention. This is the numbers that everybody wants to see. Step on the pedal. Here we go. Remember, 10,000, right? Look at the two meters, they're reading exactly the same. There's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10,000, 11,000 ish watts, give or take. Let's run it back down again. Two grand, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10,000 watt deck feet. So, let's go over here and show you drive. Input drive. There's 2,000 watt deck heat. Turn my mic gain down. That's making 2,000 watts of power. 
right now. A little over it actually, in both meters. Okay. I'll put this in a more understandable perspective. We'll now make this read, read like a stock 1000 watt slug. So about 600 watts going in. Or not even 600 watts, pardon me. Whew, gotta learn how to read a bird meter and not be awake for all these days. About 150 watts going in, producing 2,000 out. It's going up here a little bit. We'll put about 400 in it, 380 in it. That's producing almost 5,000 watts worth of carrier. Bit more in it, we'll put six in it. 600 watts produces a 7,000 watt carrier. This is where the performance of the tube falls off because the anode's so small. We're going to put 800 in it, that produces 8,000 watts of power. We'll go ahead and run it on up. There's a thousand watt dead hammer going in for drive and we're producing roughly 9,000 watts worth of carrier. That's it. Let's back this on down again. You'll never get the amp to work any harder than what we just did by throwing a huge massive DC out there. And let's give it just a second and let everything cool down again because that's a lot harder than what you actually want to run. The box. Okay. Now let's take a minute and talk about what we really got going on. This is a plain Jane everyday Cobra 25 or Cobra 29. There's nothing special about it. About 2200 watts. And let's see what we're doing for average power. Oh, wait a minute. I stepped on a pedal, didn't I? Off the scale. Let's show you what we're doing just for average power with this radio hit going into the two pill LD MOS unit. So about a thousand watts average. That's all we're doing. It's gonna become important in a minute. Now look at that, Mr. Steve. Our input tune has come up a little bit. Let's open the door. Now we're not saying we're doing this for video sake, but we're saying we're doing this for video sake. worth of reflect. The 23,500 going in, I can live with that. So, woefully overdriving it. My friend here that's with me, Mr. S, we'll call him. Appreciates the term woefully. It's amazing. So about 5,000 average. The reason that this is important is we're going to turn this radio off. And we're going to disconnect it. Now we're going to gauge, get the most screwed up gauge of barometer of bird power there is in the world. And we're going to hook up the D rail radio and we're going to do it blind. Just you and me and a couple of the thousand folks that are going to tune in to check this out. Oh, without stepping on the pedal, remember we were getting a thousand bird before. Now we're putting 1800 bird in it. Just by changing the radio. All we did was hook up the D rail radio. That's it. I have no idea what this is going to do, buddy. Are we taking bets? 
We're seeing 5,000 on the average meter right here before. We're seeing 1,000 watts worth of drive. What do you think? Seven. What'd you say? Seven. Seven? I could guess, young man. Let's turn our dead key down a little bit more. Good guess. 70, 7,500 average. Take from this what you want. Makes no difference to me. There's a reason that I show it running on both radios. The average Joe Schmo radio or the D-Row radio is because you can take from that whatever you need to take. You can believe in the giant peak peak numbers, the 12, 13,000 watts. Or you can say, wow, that thing made 7,000, 8,000 Ford modulated bird watts. Or you can say, wow, look at that. He dead keyed over 10,000 watts out of a 3,000. All the numbers are there. All the data is there. It is what it is. Let me let this thing cool down and let the amp shut off. It'll shut off in about five minutes. It's got an auto shut down, auto detimer in it. And we'll be back. So gentlemen, I want to tell you, look, this video didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. It's so going to spend a whole lot more time in depth on the inside of the box and showing it all running and turning on and how we had it all wired. And I just ran out of time. With a hard delivery date of, well, today, I had to get the thing finished. So I unfortunately ended up having to cut out a bunch of stuff that I wanted to show. I got a house full of people. I got a bunch of boxes I got to quickly build for the break. And then I got to turn and leave here and drive 700 miles and go host a 200 plus, plus person function over in the corner with all my buddies. Thank God for all my friends over there that help me get this done every year. But guys, this is the end of part four. Like I said, I haven't had time to showcase both boxes, but they run exactly the same. And I hope you appreciate everything you've seen. Both of these amps have been a labor of love. And I truly, truly appreciate every single one of you that's tuned in to check this out. And I don't get to be here doing all these fun things without all of you guys and without all of your support. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So, gentlemen, my name is BBI. And without a shadow of a doubt, I am the biggest mud duck in Idaho. And if that ever gets challenged, I'll spend more money and make it so that's not a challenge. But I appreciate you all tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen. If it's your first time watching one of my videos, please click, click subscribe, hit the notification button. Give me a thumbs up, guys, if you've enjoyed this. It makes both of us feel better. It really does. I'll see you guys. Bump, bump from the biggest duck in Idaho. I'll see ya.
Man, it's like a Marvel movie. We're sitting here waiting for the post credits. What we just looked at was just a very small snippet of some of the pictures that were available that I put up every day as I was building this thing for the last month on Facebook. Guys, I want to take a minute and I want to say thank you to my wife publicly, um, to in front of all my friends and any and everybody that's going to ever see this video. The reason I want to I want to put the credit out there is without her as the back end support for me to be able to do everything in my day. And that includes taking care of you guys as well. All the shirt orders, all the hat orders, all, all, every single thing that comes in comes out of here. Um, she's the one that manages all of that. Not that, she's also the one that helps take care of all the other little things in my life, like feeding me and all the other things that go along with it. And she was out here working on this with me. She's the one that helped me do all the sub-assemblies on the boards. If you go back and look, there's a single picture that I took of her as she was sitting there meticulously drilling all 500-some holes for the rectifier boards for the, both of these boxes. She stood out here at the drill press very diligently just drilling holes all day. I want you guys to think about that. That it's not just me out here working at it. It's a team effort. And... I got to give thanks to my customers that were willing to step up, put the money forward, and wanted to purchase both of these things. Now, arguably, and I'm not saying this to toot my own horn or anything, but arguably these are some of the best built boxes that I've seen yet come across the internet or out into the radio world. The other thing I wanted to point out is none of this is possible without the support from companies like ICA Manufacturing and my good friends over at RFJunk.com. Okay, both of those places. If we don't have access to those kind of components, the rest of us would not be here. And we have to keep that in mind. That's the honest to God truth. You know, I might have the desire to build these things, but without being able to get the cabinetry, without being able to get the Teflon, without being able to get, you know, the 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 sockets or the subassembly components for these things, none of us get to be here. None of us, none of the builders in this game get to pretend like they're anything and get to enjoy the slight elevated known of existence in some obscure portion of the internet. None of us get to enjoy that without these other companies. So I want to give a big shout out to EPD, Electronic Product Design, my good friends Peter that's down there, his beautiful and wonderful daughter Michelle. I want to give a shout out to the other Michelle at ICA Manufacturing and Tony and those guys over there. And I want to give a big shout out to my friend Chris over at RF Junk. I was taught from the very beginning by my teacher, the guy that taught me how to build and taught me how to build in this style and have this meticulous attention to detail prime. Always stay humble. Be grateful for everything that you get to work on. Do never become arrogant and assume that things are going to come to you and always give credit where you've learned something, where you've seen something, or who you learned it from. Never falsely try and pretend that you know everything, because you don't. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't know shit from Shinola. But without all these people helping me, these projects would have not come to completion in the short manner that they did, or would even been done at all. One month worth of work, and that's literally seven days a week, somewhere between 10 and sometimes 15 to 18 hours a day. So I just want to take a minute for that, and I want to say thank you guys publicly for the support. I wanted to throw a plug out for the companies that have helped me achieve both of these things and the completion of them. And I want to honestly say one last time, thank you guys for tuning in and checking out these videos. Bump, bump. I've got to run on to the next thing, and then the next thing after that, and the next thing after that. It's like the train going through the station, just running through the station onto the next one, onto the next one, onto the next one. Gentlemen, don't let your get don't let your dick get caught in a vice. I gotta go. See ya. Bye.